Chapter 3 In which Sophie enters into a castle and a bargain. There was a large black door in the black wall facing Sophie, and she made for that, hobbling briskly. The castle was uglier than ever close to. It was far too tall for its height and not a very regular shape. As far as Sophie could see in the growing darkness, it was built of huge black blocks like coal, and, like coal, the blocks were all different shapes and sizes. Chill breathed off these blocks as she got closer. But that failed to frighten Sophie at all. She just thought of chairs and firesides and stretched her hand out eagerly to the door. Her hand could not come near it. Some invisible wall stopped her hand about a foot from the door. Sophie prodded at it with an irritable finger. When that made no difference, she prodded with her stick. The wall seemed to be all over the door from as high as her stick could reach and right down to the heather sticking out from under the doorstep. Open up! Sophie cackled at it. That made no difference to the wall. Very well, Sophie said. I'll find your back door. She hobbled off to the left-hand corner of the castle, that being both nearest and slightly down a hill, but she could not get round the corner. The invisible wall stopped her again as soon as she was level with the irregular black cornerstones. At this, Sophie said a word she'd learned from Martha, that neither old ladies nor young girls are supposed to know, and stumped uphill and anti-clockwise to the castle's right-hand corner. There was no barrier there. She turned that corner and hobbled eagerly toward the second big black door in the middle of that side of the castle. There was a barrier over that door, too. Sophie glowered at it. I call that very unwelcoming, she said. Black smoke blew down from the battlements in clouds. Sophie coughed. Now she was angry. She was old, frail, chilly, and aching all over. Night was coming on, and the castle just sat and blew smoke at her. I'll speak to Howl about this, she said, and set off fiercely to the next corner. There was no barrier there. Evidently, you had to go round the castle anti-clockwise. But there, a bit sideways, in the next wall, was a third door. This one was much smaller and shabbier. The back door at last! Sophie said. The castle started to move again as Sophie got near the back door. The ground shook, the wall shuddered and creaked, and the door started to travel away sideways from her. Oh, no, you don't, Sophie shouted. She ran after the door and hit it violently with her stick. Open up, she yelled. The door sprang open inward, still moving away sideways. Sophie, by hobbling furiously, managed to get one foot up on its doorstep. Then she hopped and scrambled and hopped again, while the great black blocks round the door jolted and crunched as the castle gathered speed over the uneven hillside. Sophie did not wonder the castle had a lopsided look. The marvel was that it did not fall apart on the spot. What a stupid way to treat a building, she panted as she threw herself inside it. She had to drop her stick and hang on to the open door in order not to be jolted straight out again. When she began to get her breath, she realized there was a person standing in front of her, holding the door too. He was a head taller than Sophie, but she could see he was the merest child, only a little older than Martha. And he seemed to be trying to shut the door on her and push her out of the warm, lamp-lit, low-beamed room beyond him, into the night again. Don't you have the impudence to shut the door on me, my boy, she said. I wasn't going to, but you're keeping the door open, he protested. What do you want? Sophie looked round at what she could see beyond the boy. There were a number of probably wizardly things hanging from the beams, strings of onions, bunches of herbs, and bundles of strange roots. There were also definitely wizardy things like leather books, crooked bottles, and an old brown grinning human skull. On the other side of the boy was a fireplace, with a small fire burning in the grate. It was a much smaller fire than all the smoke outside suggested, but then this was obviously 
only a back room in the castle. Much more important to Sophie, this fire had reached the glowing rosy stage, with little blue flames dancing on the logs, and placed beside it in the warmest position was a low chair with a cushion on it. Sophie pushed the boy aside and dived for that chair. Ah,、oh, my fortune! She said and settled herself comfortably in it. It was bliss. The fire warmed her aches and the chair supported her back. And she knew that if anyone wanted to turn her out now, they were going to have to use extreme and violent magic to do it. The boy shut the door. Then he picked up Sophie's stick. And politely leaned it against the chair for her. Sophie realised that there was now no sign at all that the castle was moving across the hillside, not even the ghost of a rumble or the tiniest shaking. How odd! Tell Wizard Howl, she said to the boy, that this castle's going to come apart round his ears if it travels much further. The castle's bespelled to hold together, the boy said. But I'm afraid Hal's not here just at the moment. This was good news to Sophie. When will he be back? She asked a little nervously. Probably not till tomorrow. Now the boy said, "What do you want? Can I help you instead? I'm Hal's apprentice, Michael." This was better news than ever. I'm afraid only the wizard can possibly help me. Sophie said quickly and firmly, "It was probably true too. I'll wait if you don't mind." It was clear Michael did mind. He hovered over her a little helplessly, to make it plain to him that she had no intention of being turned out by a mere boy apprentice. Sophie closed her eyes and pretended to go to sleep. "Tell him the name's Sophie," she murmured. "Old Sophie," she added, to be on the safe side. That will probably mean waiting all night," Michael said. Since this was exactly what Sophie wanted, she pretended not to hear. In fact, she almost certainly fell into a swift doze. She was so tired from all that walking. After a moment, Michael gave her up and went back to the work he was doing at the workbench where the lamp stood. So, she would have a whole night's shelter. Even if it was on slightly false pretences, Sophie thought drowsily. Since Hal was such a wicked man, it probably served him right to be imposed upon. But she intended to be well away from here by the time Hal came back and raised objections. She looked sleepily and slyly across at the prentice. It rather surprised her to find him such a nice, polite boy. And after all, she had forced her way in quite rudely. And Michael had not complained at all. Perhaps Hal kept him in abject servility, but Michael did not look servile. He was a tall, dark boy with a pleasant, open sort of face, and he was most respectably dressed. In fact, if Sophie had not seen him at that moment carefully pouring green fluid out of a crooked flask onto black powder in a bent glass jar, she would have taken him for the son of a prosperous farmer. How odd! Still, things were bound to be odd where wizards were concerned. Sophie thought, and this kitchen or workshop was beautifully cosy and very peaceful. Sophie went properly to sleep and snored. She did not wake up when there came a flash and a muted bang from the workbench, followed by a hurriedly bitten off swear word from Michael. She did not wake when Michael, sucking his burned fingers, put the spell aside for the night. And fetched bread and cheese out of the closet. She did not stir when Michael knocked her stick down with a clatter, reaching over her for a log to put on the fire, or when Michael, looking down into Sophie's open mouth, remarked to the fireplace, "She's got all her teeth. She's not the witch of the waste, is she?" I wouldn't have let her come in if she was," the fireplace retorted. Michael shrugged and picked Sophie's stick politely up again. Then he put a log on the fire with equal politeness, and went away to bed somewhere overhead. In the middle of the night, Sophie was woken by someone snoring. 
she jumped upright, rather irritated, to discover that she was the one who had been snoring. It seemed to her that she had only dropped off for a second or so, but Michael seemed to have vanished in those seconds, taking the light with him. No doubt a wizard's apprentice learned to do that kind of thing in his first week, and he had left the fire very low. It was giving out irritating hissings and poppings. A cold draught blew on Sophie's back. Sophie recalled that she was in a wizard's castle, and also with unpleasant distinctness, that there was a human skull on a workbench somewhere behind her. She shivered and cranked her stiff old neck around, but there was only darkness behind her. Let's have a bit more light, shall we? she said. Her cracked little voice seemed to make no more noise than the crackling of the fire. Sophie was surprised. She had expected it to echo through the vaults of the castle. Still, there was a basket of logs beside her. She stretched out a creaking arm and heaved a log on the fire, which sent a spray of green and blue sparks flying up the chimney. She heaved on a second log and sat back, not without a nervous look or so behind her, where blue-purple light from the fire was dancing over the polished brown bone of the skull. The room was quite small. There was no one in it but Sophie and the skull. He's got both feet in the grave, and I've only got one, she consoled herself. She turned back to the fire, which was now flaring up into blue and green flames. Must be salt in that wood, Sophie murmured. She settled herself more comfortably, putting her knobby feet on the fender and her head into a corner of the chair where she could stare into the coloured flames and began dreamily considering what she ought to do in the morning. But she was sidetracked a little by imagining a face in the flames. It would be a thin blue face, she murmured, very long and thin with a thin blue nose. But those curly green flames on top are most definitely your hair. Suppose I didn't go until Hal gets back. Wizards can lift spells, I suppose. And those purple flames near the bottom make the mouth. You have savage teeth, my friend. You have two green tufts of flame for eyebrows. Curiously enough, the only orange flames in the fire were under the green eyebrow flames, just like eyes, and they each had a little purple glint in the middle that Sophie could almost imagine was looking at her, like the pupil of an eye. On the other hand, Sophie continued, looking into the orange flames, if the spell was off, I'd have my heart eaten before I could turn around. Don't you want your heart eaten? asked the fire. It was definitely the fire that spoke. Sophie saw its purple mouth move as the words came. Its voice was nearly as cracked as her own, full of the spitting and whining of burning wood. Naturally I don't, Sophie answered. What are you? A fire demon, answered the purple mouth. There was more whine than spit to its voice as it said, I'm bound to this hearth by contract. I can't move from this spot. Then its voice became brisk and crackling. And what are you? it asked. I can see you're under a spell. This roused Sophie from her dreamlike state. You see, she exclaimed. Can you take the spell off? There was a poppling, blazing silence, while the orange eyes in the demon's wavering blue face travelled up and down Sophie. It's a strong spell, it said at length. It feels like one of the Witch of the Wastes to me. It is, said Sophie. But it seems more than that, crackled the demon. I detect two layers, and of course you won't be able to tell anyone about it unless they know already. It gazed at Sophie a moment longer. I shall have to study it, it said. How long will that take? Sophie asked. It may take a while, said the demon, and it added in a soft, persuasive flicker. How about making a bargain with me? 
I'll break your spell if you agree to break this contract I'm under. Sophie looked warily at the demon's thin blue face. It had a distinctly cunning look as it made this proposal. Everything she had read showed the extreme danger of making a bargain with a demon, and there was no doubt that this one did look extraordinarily evil. Those long purple teeth. Are you sure you're being quite honest? she said. Not completely, admitted the demon. But do you want to stay like that till you die? That spell has shortened your life by about sixty years, if I am any judge of such things. This was a nasty thought, and one which Sophie had tried not to think about up to now. It made quite a difference. This contract you're under, she said, it's with Wizard Howl, is it? Of course, said the demon. Its voice took on a bit of a whine again. I'm fastened to this hearth and I can't stir so much as a foot away. I'm forced to do most of the magic around here. I have to maintain the castle and keep it moving and do all the special effects that scare people off, as well as anything else Hal wants. Hal's quite heartless, you know. Sophie did not need telling that Hal was heartless. On the other hand, the demon was probably quite as wicked. Don't you get anything out of this contract at all, she said. I wouldn't have entered into it if I didn't, said the demon, flickering sadly. But I wouldn't have done if I'd known what it would be like. I'm being exploited. In spite of her caution, Sophie felt a good deal of sympathy for the demon. She thought of herself making hats for Fanny while Fanny went gadding. All right, she said. What are the terms of the contract? How do I break it? An eager purple grin spread across the demon's blue face. You agree to a bargain? If you agree to break the spell on me, Sophie said, with a brave sense of saying something fatal. Done! cried the demon, his long face leaping gleefully up the chimney. I'll break your spell the very instant you break my contract. Then tell me how I break your contract, Sophie said. The orange eyes glinted at her and looked away. I can't. Part of the contract is that neither the wizard nor I can say what the main clause is. Sophie saw that she'd been tricked. She opened her mouth to tell the demon that it could sit in the fireplace until doomsday in that case. The demon realised she was going to. Don't be hasty, it crackled. You can find out what it is if you watch and listen carefully. I implore you to try. The contract isn't doing either of us any good in the long run, and I do keep my word. The fact that I'm stuck here shows that I keep it. It was in earnest, leaping about on its logs in an agitated way. Sophie again felt a great deal of sympathy. But if I'm to watch and listen, that means I have to stay here in Howe's castle, she objected. Only about a month. Remember, I have to study your spell too, the demon pleaded. But what possible excuse can I give for doing that? Sophie asked. We'll think of one. Hal's pretty useless at most things. In fact, the demon said, venomously hissing, he's too wrapped up in himself to see beyond his nose half the time. We can deceive him as long as you'll agree to stay. Very well, Sophie said. I'll stay. Now find an excuse. She settled herself comfortably in the chair while the demon thought. It thought aloud, in a little crackling, flickering murmur, which reminded Sophie rather of the way she had talked to her stick when she walked here, and it blazed while it thought with such a glad and powerful roaring that she dozed again. She thought the demon did make a few suggestions. 
She remembered shaking her head to the notion that she should pretend to be Hal's long-lost great-aunt, and to one or two other ones even more far-fetched. But she did not remember very clearly. The demon at length fell to singing a gentle, flickering little song. It was not in any language Sophie knew, or she thought not, until she distinctly heard the word saucepan in it several times, and it was very sleepy-sounding. Sophie fell into a deep sleep, with a slight suspicion that she was being bewitched now, as well as beguiled. But it did not bother her particularly. She would be free of the spell soon.